great people to talk about this. Um, we've got uh, Doug Laxton, who has spent some time at the IMF, spent some time at the Bank of Canada, who's now a adjunct professor at the Nova School of Business in Portugal. And we've got Francisco Ruiz Murcia, who's a colleague of mine at McGill. He's the chair of the McGill Economics Department. And he spent a bunch of time in some central banks and uh, a couple of different universities. And he's been thinking about monetary policy for a long time. Um, and so we're very happy to have these two people uh, to talk us through the issue. So our technical glitch was that for some reason, Doug Laxon, who you can all tell is in San Francisco, uh, actually he's unable to share his screen. So one of our technical wizards behind the curtain is going to share a screen and show the slides. And then Doug will just uh, audibly let us know when to advance the slides. So uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Doug and Doug's technical magician behind the curtain. Wow, okay. Magically, I have some slides, um, but I have no control over them, uh, which is a very, sort of reminds me like back to the day where we had to take uh, these things to a machine and stick them in there and then and then they would come out with plastic and and ascertain and we'd have to like rip it off and put it on so we're, we've kind of backtracked a little bit but anyway um, it's very nice to hear uh, your Canadian accents I'm a Canadian as well but I'm living in Portugal um, I spent 13 years at the Bank of Canada uh, developing, uh, working on developing their monetary policy framework. And then I went to the IMF and I spent about 25 years going to other central banks trying to teach them that. I retired from the IMF in 2018 and I've been working with central banks since then and having a lot of fun doing it, uh, developing monetary policy frameworks. If you're interested in any of this stuff, you can go to my website, uh, which is posted on the screen. Um, we also offer online courses about how to de develop, implement uh, monetary policy uh, frameworks. So can you switch screens, please? Okay, so my talk today, despite the fact that it's based on one paper that has a thousand references, it's really based on a book. Um, and this book was just before I left the fund in 2018 called Advancing the Frontiers of Monetary Policy. And it was by Tobias, Adrian, and Morris Obsfeld. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we thought the state of the art was at the time. But in addition to that, we ran into the effect of lower bound on interest rates. And so I was asked to produce this other paper about how to think about macroeconomic management when policy space was constrained. And this paper was entitled A Comprehensive, Consistent, and coordinated approach to economic policy. So obviously it included fiscal policy, structural policies, everything else to kind of coordinate and create a macroeconomic framework. Next slide. So the state of the art is what we call inflation forecast targeting. That is otherwise known as flexible inflation targeting. And under IFT, the central bank's inflation forecast is this ideal intermediate target that's used to communicate how the central bank is managing the short and open inflation trade-off. So it's either an explicit uh, dual mandate central bank like the Fed, or it's like many of the other central banks in the world that are practicing inflation targeting that realize that if they don't care about the real economy, it will result in real instability. So they either have an explicit mandate or they have an implicit mandate. They do it because 
it's it's it would cause incredibly large costs on the economy not to do it. IFT is also based on all available information, views about how the economy works. So in the central banks that practice this correctly, this is not a technical thing that our, us economists do, where we have like uh, kind of one model and we ask what the model says. It's meant to represent what is the knowledge of the entire central bank or knowledge of the profession and so on. Um, that might, might sound a little technical, a little fine tuning and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of emphasis in the central banks that do this on the importance of uncertainty and avoiding what Olivier Blanchard called dark corners or what Steve Polas called the prudent risk management approach to policy formulation and communications, please. Slide. So it all starts off with a view of the monetary policy transmission mechanism. So we looked at this slide 30 years ago when monetary policy transparency was very, very low, where we started off with this idea that you should say very little and let action speak. The left-hand side would be the policy instrument. And now it's the policy instrument path because it's the policy instrument path that influences things like longer term interest rates that in fact economic decisions or asset prices like the exchange rate. So this is gonna be a very big part of my talk. Um, and that in turn during normal times affects aggregate demand, the output gap, inflation and so on. And there's lots of shocks. Well, the problem is we're not in normal times that we can be constrained by the effect of lower abound. And if this transmission mechanism becomes ineffective, there's a potential fragility um, where you can go either to a deflationary trap or a low inflation trap where things are bad. So you need unconventional instruments. So what are they? QE, negative interest rates, funding for credit, and I heard this the first day by David N. Delfato, fiscal backstops, okay? So you need to have something to come in when monetary policy cannot uh, achieve what its objectives are. So let's carry on. Okay, so this is just uh, an example of some of the benefits. So this is taking some very seasoned inflation forecast targeting countries and it's plotting over uh, 2015 to 2017. Remember commodity prices halved and the economy went into a recessionary kind of situation. Um, if we divide the countries that were practicing this inflation forecast targeting regime and the countries that weren't like Europe and Japan, we can see that when actual inflation fell below target, okay, which happened everywhere, long-term inflation expectations ratcheted downwards in countries like Japan and Europe. Whereas um, in countries like, well, Czech Republic, New Zealand, Sweden, United States, and Canada, for example, long-term inflation expectations continued to be anchored to the target. And in some cases, people even, even expected like there was gonna be an increase in inflation in the future. And this is a good thing. This is gonna be a big part of my talk, please. Okay, just a bit on the history of inflation targeting. Uh, New Zealand was the very first country that did it in 1989. Uh, musingly, uh, they were the least equipped country in the world to do it analytically. Canada was the best equipped country in the sense that we had all the analytical framework and firepower to do it, but they, they just did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. Um, a lot of people from the Bank of Canada, including me, went there to establish this framework 
And over the next uh, several years, we developed what we call the forecasting and policy analysis system and jumped to what we now call full-fledged flexible inflation targeting. So that's a regime where you basically publish everything, including the path of the policy rate. Another good example, there are many, many examples of this where we help countries do this. I'm just picking, just picking a couple here. But one of the best was the Czech Republic that was thrown into uh, a flexible exchange rate regime. It had a fixed exchange rate regime before that. So during the Asian crisis uh, in the late 1990s, it was thrown into this world of flexible inflation targeting or and uh, by 2002, they, with our help, they had developed a forecasting and policy analysis system. Now, what they did was not like what the New Zealand uh, did. Uh, New Zealand went straight to publishing the path of the policy rate. The Czech Republic went for a number of years between 2002 and 2008 basically just using words to describe what the underlying policy assumptions were in the forecast. And then by 2008, the policymakers were so comfortable with the framework that they decided this was the best way to communicate monetary policy. Canada, unfortunately, because of its great success, um, and this is a very important part of the story, um, Success means that you don't change. Um, because of the great success in achieving 2% inflation did not really keep up with its, its little brothers. So the little brothers went on effectively to increase uh, monetary policy, policy transparency and become the best sort of examples in the world. Turn to the next. So this is some, just some examples about how oh, important um, Lars Svensson thinks this is. Um, he thinks that flexible inflation forecast targeting is all about um, choosing the path for inflation and unemployment forecasts that look good. So as opposed to it being an optimal control solution, it's something where the policymakers look at it and they say, we like these trade-offs. And he also goes further and says that explicit discussion and selection of the policy rate path, if you don't publish it, you've got an incomplete decision-making process. Um, in fact, he then goes on to say that you're hiding uh, the most important information by not publishing this information about how you're trying to achieve your objectives. Go on. So this is how it's done. Uh, this is the Czech Republic, one of the examples. Uh, they were hit by some shocks after uh, the European debt crisis, where they were going into a risk of deflation. And they put out a forecast where they projected an overshoot in inflation. And this was totally uh, uncommon for any central bank to do. So central bank conservatism always said, we're always going to bring the inflation back slowly to the target. We're not going to plan to overshoot. Let's go to the next slide. Good example is the Bank of Canada forecast. So this is the forecast during the global financial crisis. This is a period in time where we actually needed central banks like Canada, US and many others to actually say, that we are going to promote very stimulative policies and we're going to plan to overshoot because we want to drive real interest rates down and we want to achieve uh, our inflation over time. Um, we can think of this as uh, achieving an inflation rate that's on average equal to the target when the central bank uh, forecasts an inflation that's projected to overshoot what its underlying target was. These forecasts um, do not look like they are generated by any economic model. So there's no economic model that always smoothly converges into, into a 2% target. These are 
forecast where someone is simply just overruling what the logic would be in a situation like um, the global financial crisis where you would simply want to try to tell people that you're planning to overshoot and so on. Next page. Um, so this is part of the problem. Um, part of the problem is with the ownership of the forecasts. So when the forecasts are created by economists, they will naturally have these overshooting properties. And the central bank, when it communicates, as it does in the Czech National Bank, uh, it's very clear right in the very preamble of the monetary policy report that it's the central bank staff that's producing this forecast. And it's used as an important frame of reference for the monetary policy committee. So in other words, monetary policy committees cannot produce forecasts. It's not their job to produce forecasts. It's their job to take forecasts from the staff and then to comment them, comment on them, using them as a frame of reference to explain what their views are in real time. And anyway, that's, that's very, very important because if you don't understand that, then you will never ever be able to implement one of these modern forecasting and policy analysis systems. You have to understand that for, there are forecasters and there are policymakers and there are two different kinds of, of people. Go ahead. Okay, monetary policy transparency checklist. So all the in, ro, inflation forecast targeting central banks that I'm talking about for, have all this in them, okay? In the sense that they have a numerical long-term objective, they're clear about policy trade-offs, they have a monetary policy report, they have press conferences, they have minutes, they have an endogenous policy interest rate path that's consistent with the dual mandate or other policy instruments if they're at the effect of lower bound. And they publish a complete macro forecast and description of the forecast and policy analysis system. Canada kind of fails on a lot, number of dimensions. They have an exogenous interest rate forecast they have an exogenous exchange rate forecast. And both of those things are not consistent with uh, a modern monetary policy regime. So carry on. So this is how monetary policy transparency evolved in New Zealand. So it started off almost at zero uh, once they did it because they had no framework to speak of. Uh, they developed a monetary policy framework, and by 1998, they published a book. It was called The Forecasting Policy Analysis System. Uh, it was actually, <laughs> it was created by a bunch of Bank of Canada economists that went from the Bank of Canada to New Zealand. And as you can see, that then provided the foundation, once the policymakers got used to using it, uh, to higher and higher levels of transparency. And you can see Canada, Canada's transparency is about half the level of what it, what it is in New Zealand today. Go down. Slide down, please. Czech Republic, or New Zealand in this case, same story. Um, Developing the forecasting and pulse analysis system provided this, this foundation for further increases in transparency over time as the policymakers became more um, confident in it. Okay, go. So this is the Czech National Bank. So same story, okay? And you can see the same story. We're putting out a paper with Chile, exactly the same story. So the leaders in transparency in the world are all countries that invested heavily in developing forecasting and policy analysis systems. The policy makers became comfortable with those systems and that provided the foundation for higher and higher levels of transparency. Carry on. Go on. 
Okay, so inflation in Canada. So this was referred to earlier in the conference. This is a chart of inflation since early 1995 when we had a 2% target. And you can see inflation on average was almost equal to the target up until the global financial crisis in 2008. So I'm, I'm plotting actually the price level gap, which is a, which is a line which has a 2% slope. So if you go to the next slide, you can see that over that period, there was very small deviations of the price level from that 2% gap. Since 2008, in the next slide, you can see that the price level gap or average inflation has fallen systematically below what average inflation is. And I'm gonna argue that's a, that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing in the sense that it's creating uncertainty in the future price level. Um, it would be better to have a policy that actually had some weight on what the price level was to, to eliminate uh, excessive uncertainty in the price level. Just as we thought that there was excessive uncertainty in inflation 20, 30 years ago, we have to also think about excessive uncertainty in the price level today because that affects people on fixed incomes and so on. Next slide. So this goes to the dual mandate. Uh, in the paper, we have the output gap, but in the presentation, I just included unemployment. So you can see during the global financial crisis in 2008, unemployment went up and then it went down very, very, very slowly. Um, there was a large initial stimulus in 08, in sorry, 09 and 010, when things were under pressure, it was actually a G20 global fiscal stimulus. But after 2010, um, fiscal policy and monetary policy, in fact, Bank of Canada actually raised rates by 100 basis points, they kind of backed off both fiscal and monetary. And as a result of that, we got stuck because we were hit with a sequence of shocks and unemployment stayed excessively too high. So you can see that's very much correlated with the previous slide, which shows that um, the price level was allowed to fall, you know, way, well below what it what a two percent line was. So this is what you know. We obviously have to care about. You know, this unemployment was very very costly. It was a very large shock, and we need to have policies in place that can actually deal with this. Next slide. Okay, so at this point, I can go two directions. I can go academic and show you some math, or I can simply just show you what the mechanisms are. Um, the standard mechanisms that were in that transmission mechanism that I, that I showed you earlier. But think about normal times to begin with, where you can have um, shocks that reduce aggregate demand more than aggregate supply. I don't like calling them demand shocks. There are shocks that have more demand side implications and supply implications. That's a much better way of thinking about it. But I wanna think about a shock where all of a sudden demand comes along and it's weaker than, than what people were anticipating. So this would be like the global financial crisis and it would be a little bit like now. And so what happens in normal times when you have a credible regime is that people expect in financial markets, and this is very, very important to distinguish between financial markets and, and wage and price setters, um, that nominal policy rates are gonna fall over time. And as a result of that, real current and future real interest rates are gonna fall over time. And that's gonna result in a depreciation in the exchange rate. And that asset price, along with lower real interest rates is gonna help act as a absorber to the shock. In other words, the economy is gonna be buffeted by, by these lower asset prices and these, uh, these lower interest rates. Now let's compare that 
to a period where you're hit at the effective lower bound? Well, you could have two situations. One is you've got a credible active policy where something steps in like QE or fiscal policy, and it does the same job that interest rates do during normal times. And then you've got the worst of all possible situations, which we've seen in Japan, and we're starting to see a little bit in Europe, where the nominal interest rate is, hit, is, is at the effective floor, inflation expectations kind of ratchet down, current future real interest rates ratchet upwards, and actually the exchange rate appreciates, uh, and the economy, the economy actually declines more. You know, you might think of this as purely just math, which you'll see on the next slide, which you're welcome to look at on my website uh, to explain the logic of this. But if you go to the next slide, you'll actually see that this works in practice. So this is Canada and Japan uh, after the global financial crisis. And so the first set of numbers are Canada and the second set of numbers are Japan. So going into the global financial crisis, the short-term interest rate in Canada was 420 basis points. So we had significant policy space. If you look at Japan, Japan had just actually raised interest rates. They thought they were out of the effective lower bound, unfortunately. Um, so they had very little policy space. What happened? Well, um, Canada, which was hit by a double whammy. So they were hit by an external demand shock from the world, as well as a large shock in global commodity prices. It got a significant depreciation in the exchange rate, a large reduction in the real interest rate. And as a result, those two factors offset this massive shock that was hitting it, resulting in a 3.5% output gap in 2009. Poor Japan, and this is really poor Japan, they are a commodity importer. They should have benefited from this reduction in the terms of trade because they import commodities. But instead, because they didn't have the policy space, what happened is that real interest rates rose, the real exchange rate appreciated by 20%, and they had an output gap that was twice as large. And this output gap was partly because of a 24% reduction in exports and partly because of a large contraction in domestic demand because of high real interest rates. Carry on. Doug, I just want to give you the five minute warning, okay? Okay, you got it. Okay, so in the paper, we talk about two things, okay? Uh, we actually have an empirical model that said, how should the Canada improve inflation targeting, where we go back and do counterfactual examples of thinking about what if we would have had a loss function that had uh, the dual mandate in it. And then we realized, oh, that's too complicated. So let's go back to a paper uh, that we wrote uh, before the global financial crisis that simply had a few equa few key equations. And one is the output gap equation, the inflation equation, uh, UIP equation. You can see that we don't even have US variables in it. That's equation three. An equation for expectations that the exchange rate where we back off of pure model consistent expectations and so on. And then two loss functions. One loss function that has the dual mandate, which has equal weights on inflation and output and interest rate volatility. And then another loss function where we place a very small weight on the price level gap. And I think this is very much uh, consistent with the way the US is doing it now, in the sense that we're, we're not gonna make a big deal about this price level gap. I think the reason why we haven't had price level targeting in the past is we, 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 we placed way too much emphasis on this. Uh, we want to reduce uncertainty in the future price level, but we don't want to do it in a way that would be counterproductive 
for stabilizing the real economy. So this is how we represent those ideas in loss functions. So in the next in the next set of slides, we just show you a very illustrative uh, simulation where we shock that economy with uh, a shock to aggregate demand. And again, could be aggregate supply as well, that creates an output gap that's sort of equivalent to what we observed during the global financial crisis. And so what do we observe? So the policy with the dual mandate and average inflation targeting is gonna try and reduce the interest rate, keep it low for about a year or so. And that's gonna be sufficient in this case to actually get people to believe that inflation is gonna be higher in the future, real interest rates are gonna be lower, the real exchange rate is gonna depreciate by a lot. And as a result, people are gonna believe that inflation on average is gonna be equal to this 2% target. Now, a big question for the skeptics, I see there's a lot on my screen right now, especially the one writing, writing questions down, uh, is what if people didn't believe this? Well, it turns out as a person that worked on inflation targeting countries where all these regimes were non-credible, the important way to interpret these simulations is not that they're all true, but to ask the question is if the expectations are not consistent with what I've assumed here, what does the central bank do next? So obviously they communicate and then they act. They communicate and they act. And in every possible situation that we've observed where they've communicated and they've acted, okay, in a consistent manner, we've observed outcomes that are positive uh, generally. Sometimes in the case of the early inflation targeters, it took five years. In the case of Canada, it took about five years. In the case of all the early inflation targeters, it took about five years. Uh, in some cases, it took a little bit less. In some cases, it took a little bit longer. Go to the next slide. Doug, can I get you, give you one more minute to wrap up? Yep, you got it. And so this is very much going to uh, be related to the point about fiscal policy that if you announce a regime like this and you do believe that it's not going to be credible initially, then it can be very, very important that fiscal policy step in to help support aggregate demand and make it credible. So we know that fiscal policy, especially in a place like Canada where you know, fiscal policy is in pretty good shape in terms of policy space, that fiscal policy could also step in and actually make this regime credible over time. So I just wanna add that there's a lot of sensitivity analysis at the end that assumes uh, less extreme assumptions about expectations, which of course policymakers are interested in, that policymaking is not just about one set of simulations, it's about uh, looking at and discussing about uh, many different, many different assumptions and, and coming up with the best possible policy. Now, in terms of conclusions. Okay, conclusions are very simple. We need to include a formal dual mandate in the joint statement of the Government of Canada and the Bank of Canada on the renewal of the inflation control target in 2021 and the Bank of Canada Act. So this would be just what New Zealand did. Uh, they did it last year. I'm sure we can, we can find language that might even be as good or better than what New Zealand did. Second, give more meaning to the price stability objective by adopting average inflation targeting. Thirdly, establish a fiscal rule that would provide fiscal transfers to low and middle income households in times when there is significant economic slack and high unemployment. And more importantly, to make sure that everything is functioning, uh, like in those examples that I gave you earlier, ensure high levels of accountability and transparency for both monetary policy 
for both the monetary policy framework and the fiscal rule. So thank you for your attention. Um, sorry for the technical uh, issues. Thank you, Doug. Okay, uh, Francisco, uh, do you have slides, Francisco? Or are you gonna share your screen? Uh, yep. Uh, okay. Take it away. Um, sorry, there we are. Uh, here we go. Okay, well, thank you. So, uh, Chris, do I take it that I have uh, 20 minutes? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. that's good. Okay. 15, 20. I'll give you a five minute warning at 15. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much again for the invitation uh, to discuss this paper and for the organization of this conference that has been run uh, beautifully. So, um, so we'll be discuss, discussing the dog paper about um, the fact that the time has changed to, the, the time has come to change the Bank of Canada mandate. And um, the outline that I will follow in my discussion is the following. At first, I will provide a brief uh, overview um, of, of, of the paper. And then I have a set of comments that are structured um, in four parts. First, looking at academic literature. Um, just one small comment about the model in the paper and empirical comparison between Canada and the US and then some practical issues. And then I will summarize. All right, so, so this paper uh, presents what is a very ambitious um, blueprint for the conduct of monetary policy. It has many elements in it. Uh, they include the dual mandate, um, average inflation targeting, and uh, increased transparency. Um, since my homework was to look at the dual mandate, that's pretty much what I'm going to be uh, doing in this discussion. I will, talk, I will not talk at all about uh, the suggestions regarding transparency or average inflation targeting. Uh, the paper does include a model which is based on previous work with uh, Kameni et al. Uh, but I meant it to include a uh, loss function that involves a dual mandate and average inflation targeting. And a central result of that exercise is that when you show this model, the input responses that it generates suggest that under a dual mandate, the Bank of Canada would have acted more aggressively to reduce unemployment during the financial crisis. So this is kind of uh, the, the, the core argument for, well, or one of the arguments for, for a dual mandate. All right, so let me just first start to my comments and then the first set of comments concern the academic literature. All right, so let us imagine that we, the, we give the central bank uh, the mandate to reduce uh, inflation deviations from some target or some optimal value but also to um, reduce uh, the deviations of some output measure from a target. And so the notation is as follows. Here E is expectation, I the interest rate, which is the monetary policy instrument, phi is the inflation rate, and Y is the, uh, the output measure. Could be unemployment, could be the output gap. Okay, so the first thing uh, that we should notice when, when, when we look at this mandate is that there are two targets. So there is a target that concerns inflation, but there is also a target that concerns, say, unemployment. So there are two, two targets, but there is only one instrument. And so in normal circumstances, it would be a little bit hard to actually hit both targets with this one instrument. And so, then there is a question that arises, which is, okay, so how should the central bank trade off deviations of inflation and output from their targets? Or if we want to put it differently, what is the value of lambda, so this parameter in the, in the loss function, that maximizes social wealth? So this is a large body, a large body of um, academic literature that tries to answer this question. And uh, the answer is basically that it depends. Um, so for instance, there is a, the paper by Blanchard and Galli in 2007 in the Journal of uh, Money Credit and Banking. 
And here, they are looking at the basic uh, neo-Keynesian model. Um, and in that model, this model has the property that if you stabilize inflation, you immediately stabilize output. But you don't only stabilize output with respect to the second basis, to the, to the, um, to the natural rate of output where there are, say, uh, productivity. But actually, it's a property of this model that you actually stabilize it with respect to the efficient level of, out, of output that would take place if there were no distortions. Um, so this is the so-called divine uh, coincidence. Um, but actually, most of this particular paper is concerned with um, bringing into the picture a more general model compared with the basic neo Keynesian model where there are real rigidities. And in that case, the basic coincidence, the, the divine coincidence breaks down. It is still the case that uh, stabilizing um, inflation stabilizes output with respect to the natural rate, but it's no longer stabilizing um, output with respect to the, um, um, to the fission rate. Sorry, I cannot see my slides anymore. Um, okay, so, um, all right. So, so in that case, well, lambda uh, is no longer zero. The divine coincidence doesn't hold anymore. Then Woodford in his book, in chapter six or five, I don't remember, um, um, find that the level of land that would um, uh, deliver the highest level of welfare is actually a very small number, at 0 0.05 compared to one, which is what you would give to inflation. In a more recent paper, uh, De Bartoli et al. consider you know, a very general model, plenty of frictions and distortions, and they find that lambda is something like one. And um, they consider several uh, versions of their model. So actually there are specifications where lambda would be infinity. And it's actually kind of the mirror image of the, of the um, divine coincidence. So in the divine coincidence, if I stabilize inflation, I stabilize output, so then I should, not give any weight to output, I just simply stabilize inflation. In the Bartoli et al., there is an example where you actually should stabilize output and stabilizing output stabilizes inflation. Okay, so the, what is the story here? Well, the story here is that in the academic literature, the value of lambda that maximizes welfare is, is model dependent. And it depends on the imperfections uh, that, um, the imperfections in the model and the shocks in the model. So for instance, the Bartoli et al. have a different result than in the paper of uh, Giustiniano, Primicieri, and Tambalotti. And the issue is that <clears throat> in the paper of Giustiniano et al., there are no price and market shocks. So that is, um, that is why in, in Giustiniano et al., the, uh, basically there is hardly any trade of between inflation and output and stabilizing inflation pretty much stabilizes society. All right. So the academic literature is, this is still some work to do here, clearly. Um, it doesn't really quite settle the issue of, of what is the value of lambda. And this is unfortunate, but that's, that is the state of research at this point. All right, what about this paper? Well, this paper has a model too, but as you saw, uh, the model is basically ad hoc. So it's unclear how these equations relate to, fundamenta, to fundamentals, to preferences and technology. And because of that, it's not possible to, to uh, do any welfare analysis. The model also contains some parameters, but it's not clear where they come from, whether the model was estimated, or maybe there was some calibration. Um, I don't know. It is unclear how well it fits the Canadian data as well. Um, so overall, this is just a nice illustration of what could happen if a central bank were to target uh, both um, inflation and an output gap, but overall it's not very uh, compelling. On the other hand, to be fair to the authors, they are very aware of this, and that's why they repeatedly uh, warn the reader that this is basically an illustration, and they do sensitivity analysis as well. All right, so let me just move to the, to the next comment. So theory is not super helpful at this point, so let us try to look at the data. <clears throat> 
so I'm going to compare Canada. I'm going to compare the, with respect to the U.S. All right. So just just to to set the stage, uh, so we just remember that Canada announced inflation re uh, reduction targets in late February of 1991, and the goal was to reach inflation of two percent by the end of 95. Inflation actually came down uh, quite fast, and the policy after uh, after 95 was to target a 2% rate uh, of CPI inflation uh, with a tolerance range of plus or minus 1%. And this framework has been renewed a number of times with, without any big change. The US, in contrast, um, th there is a long tradition in the US of um, something that resembles a dual mandate of, of uh, uh, of asking the Fed to take to care about both inflation and uh, an output, uh, but this was just formalized in the Federal Reserve Reform Act of uh, 1977, where the Fed was instructed uh, to promote maximum employment, stable pr prices, and a moder and moderate long-term interest rates. And then, uh, in January 2012, the Fed adopted an inflation target. Uh, that applies to PC inflation, it's unclear that this is the uh, overriding guide of policy uh, at this point, but, uh, but there you have it. All right, so let me just show you a picture now. So this is the rate of inflation in Canada, and then I'm going to be looking, starting at this period where the inflation target had reached 2%. Um, and then it, uh, this is the, the, exactly the same period, time period for the US. Uh, and then I'm going to end the sample here when um, uh, the Fed announced an inflation target. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare a set of very basic statistics for Canada and the US for this period where um, Canada is following an inflation target and the US is still subject to a dual mandate and has not yet introduced an inflation target. All right, so the sample is going to go from, uh, it's going to be monthly data uh, from 1996, the first month, to 2011, the month 12. The key difference at the time uh, between Canada and the US um, is their monetary policy regime. Um, and then so what I'm trying to do is, okay, so the theory uh, doesn't quite pin down Lambda, the way that we should give to, to output deviations or, or, or unemployment deviations from, from the natural rate. So let us see what the data can tell us. And here we have not quite a natural experiment, but a very natural comparison to make because these two countries in many ways are quite similar. On the other hand, okay, there are important differences. So clearly financial regulation is not the same in both countries. Regarding unemployment and the natural rate of unemployment, it's important to keep in mind that unemployment insurance is different in Canada than in the US. Incarceration rate in the US is high enough that actually, according to some people in labor economics, it has a bite, it affects the measurement of unemployment in the US and so on. All right, so take this comparison with a grain of salt. This is the first thing, I mean, if, if one is arguing in favor of the a dual mandate. Okay, the first thing to do is to look at the data, since again, the theory doesn't quite pin down the thing. Uh, and then let us see how far we go with that. All right, so this is the full sample from 96 to 2011. Let me just start talking about inflation. So average inflation in the US has been very close to the target. Sorry, average inflation in Canada has been very close to the target. And this is why, um, this consensus view that um, inflation targeting has been so successful uh, in Canada. The standard deviation uh, is only 0.9. The tolerance range is actually one. So in fact, most observations are within, within the, the target bound. The US features a higher inflation rate and more, more volatile inflation rate for the same period. Now let us look at unemployment. Again, if you look at the mean, here, the issue of institutional differences, incarceration rates, um, unemployment insurance, and so on, uh, has a role. It is well known that um, uh, inflation rate in Canada is on average higher than in the US. 
But the issue is about the standard deviation. And here, the standard deviation is lower in Canada for this sample period compared with the US under a dual mandate. If I look at another output measure, uh, output growth, these are really basically the same. All right, so this is kind of a, a sample period that covers um, the financial crisis. And the financial crisis was more, um, uh, more severe in the US than in Canada. So the first thing to do, and again, is just simply to shot the, uh, cut the sample before the financial crisis. And so let us see if things are different or not. So again, the rate of inflation in Canada is very close to target and the volatility is, uh, is relatively low, certainly lower than the US. And inflation in the US is higher than in Canada. So this shopping the sample to exclude the financial crisis doesn't really change this conclusion dramatically. But things are a little bit more moderate when you look at unemployment because here, uh, in, unemployment in Canada is more volatile than the US during this sample period. Then on the other hand, regarding output growth, output growth is less volatile in, in Canada on the inflation targeting than in the US under the dual market. Francisco, can I give you the five minute rule? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So with these caveats, it is not obvious to me, just looking at the data, that the dual mandate in the US has delivered superior output up outcomes than inflation targeting. Certainly the data, the first thing you would do, which is just to compare these two countries, uh, the data doesn't screen in favor of a dual mandate as far as output is concerned, but inflation does appear to be higher and more volatile in the US than in Canada. All right, so let me just switch to the final part of my um, um, discussion, and it concerns a number of issues um, like accountability in the case of the dual mandate. So this is the remit to the Monetary Policy Committee of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Uh, it required to formulate monetary policy with goals of maintaining a stable general level of prices over medium term and supporting maximum sustainable employment. This is from April of last year. Uh, from the Federal Reserve Reform Act of 1977, we read, that the goal is maintain long-run growth of the monetary and credit aggregates commensurate with the economy's long-run potential to increase production, so as to promote the goals of maximum employment and stable prices and moderate uh, long-term interest rates. So actually, the, the, the US doesn't have a dual mandate. It actually has a triple mandate. Okay, now looking at the joint statement from the government of Canada and the, and the Bank of Canada from the uh, latest renewal in 2016, agree to renew the inflation target on the following basis. The target will continue to be defined in terms of the 12 month rate of change in the total CPI. The inflation target will continue to be the 2% midpoint of the one to 3% inflation control rate. Okay, so when I uh, finished this slide, what came to mind is this little um, sketch in Sesame Street where you have this different objects, kids are presented with different objects, and they're supposed to choose the one that is different from the other one. Because you see here, there is a mandate that is not like the others. In the case of the Bank of Canada, the thing is crystal clear. So I'm telling you what is the target, I'm telling you what is the number, I'm telling you how it's constructed, is year over year, and I'm, I'm telling you what the magic number is. When you look at the dual mandates, uh, well, uh, it's not clear what the notion of price stability is, uh, is being uh, used. Uh, maximum sustainable employment, I'm not sure about that. I sort of know what they have in mind, but it's not like super obvious. So if I'm a Canadian in, in this democratic society and I want to know if my central bank is doing what it's supposed to be doing, in the case of Canada, it's simple. Just this number, I open the newspaper, if I have an internet connection, I can easily find the number and I know whether my central bank is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It is not obvious that this is the case in the US or, or will be the case in New Zealand um, in the future. And related to this is this issue of measurement and communication. I mean, maximum sustainable employment. I mean, how is this to be measured? Um, someone mentioned that um, output measures are revised continuously. So this is, this is an issue for um, uh, for how we communicate uh, policy to the public. Uh, 
uh, what is the definition of price stability and what index it applies to? The dual mandates, as far as I know, but maybe I'm wrong about this, are silent about this. And there was an effort, though, in the US after the Federal Reserve uh, Reform Act. There was this Full Employment Act that passed in uh, 1978. It's independent of the Reform Act. But what is interesting about it is that it sets out a specific inflation and output targets. And it is, it is quite um, amusing to read this, this act because it is full of good intentions and very questionable economics. So regarding targets, uh, it does set, set out specific targets about what unemployment and what a specific measure of unemployment should be what number by what time. And it does the same for, uh, for inflation. Okay, but this is 1978. So none of these things happened five years later. Um, among the other things in this act were uh, the goal of achieving zero inflation uh, by 1990, sorry, by 1988 and balanced trade as well. So there were sorts of things in this act. Um, all right, so in summary. Francisco, yeah, final minute. Yes. Perfect, thank you. And yours. So, uh, so this paper is a very nice contribution to the debate regarding monetary, the monetary policy framework in Canada. Um, from what I can see in the literature, uh, it's just not completely clear that the dual mandate is superior to inflation targeting, neither in theory nor in practice. Um, yet there are some serious issues regarding accountability, measurement, communication, that I think uh, one should take into account uh, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. And thank you, Doug. Okay, great presentation, great discussion. I've got, I'm looking at the chat box, so please feel free to uh, let me know in the chat box if you have a question. I've got uh, two people who have questions and a third who maybe has a question. Uh, first on deck is David Andalfato, and then second is Angelo Molino. And Greg Catch, I'm giving you an option on a question. You've got a comment in the chat box. I don't know whether you want to make that comment or ask a question, but I'm going to give you the option. Uh, and then whoever comes after that. So let's start with Dave Andalfato. Thanks a lot, Chris. And, and hello to Doug. It's been a very long time, Doug. Perhaps uh, 20 years or more since I last saw you. So enjoyed your talk very much. I had one quick question. I'm very intrigued with uh, when you're writing about your principles of inflation forecast targeting. Have you uh, and your co-authors given any thought to kind of the ideas proposed by Bob Hetzel about um, market using market-based inflation forecasts rather than model generated or internal forecasts what do you see uh, you see that as a special case or do you see some problems using market-based forecasts i think that would be a feasible option with canada too right they have the real return bonds doug you are muted there we go okay. Uh, there's a very interesting story here. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Uh, Milton Friedman, who of course was uh, better than many, many, many people in the profession, was very much against the idea of inflation targeting or trusting central banks uh, doing anything. Okay. And he had a student that walked into his office one day and said, we could fix up this entire problem if we issued an index bond. And if the central bank simply just issued the index bond, they would get a measure of inflation expectations and the real interest rate. And we could simply just create a rule that said, well, raise the real interest rate when inflation expectations are above the target, okay? Most people don't know about that. Um, and in practice, uh, the Bank of Israel kind of practiced that sort of implicitly in the sense that they wouldn't come up with their own forecasts and that sort of thing for years and years and years. 
But the problem is that it gives rise to um, multiple equilibrium, okay? Because if you're looking at the market for the anchor and the market is looking at you for the anchor, who is actually providing the anchor? So we call this the monkey and the mirror problem, okay? So, um, so I wanted to stress that very, very fundamental point uh, because Friedman eventually, I think, you know, he understood that point. Um, but in addition to that, the Central Bank of Israel went on to develop their own views about what the fundamentals were and started to publish what those, you know, what those views are. And of course, using information from the market is, you know, totally legit, whatever information is available. It was in my slide, whatever is available, you use it. Okay. So did that answer your question? Chris? Uh, Dave and Alfano, you are muted. Yeah, no doubt people prefer it that way, but uh, thank you, Doug. I, I was actually uh, curious exactly about that uh, point about the multiplicity and whether there might be a workaround or whether this is just conventional wisdom by now that it's just introduces a theoretical indeterminacy, whether as a practical matter it does, I don't know, but I'll be interested to look in the case of Israel. I didn't know about that. Sorry, was I muted there? Angelo Molino, you're next up. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I was writing a lot of notes on uh, your presentation, Doug, and it only occurred to me at the end that it was about the dual mandate. Uh, but I, I had a lot of things to talk about, but I'll ask about the dual mandate one. I mean, as far as I could tell, your, your argument was that if you look at uh, the unemployment rate in Canada after the great financial crisis, it declined too slowly. And uh, a dual mandate would have uh, helped reduce that unemployment uh, more quickly. And uh, I guess uh, you'd have to look at, or you could say, look at what the US did under the dual mandate. It was able to uh, get its unemployment rate down uh, faster and lower than we did in Canada. But it's, it's very hard to, to make those cross country comparisons. Uh, as uh, Francisco mentioned, we measure unemployment differently in the two countries. Uh, we have different shocks that hit the two countries. I mean, Canada suffered from uh, what was happening to oil prices. We were more uh, exposed to uh, the second recession that hit, uh, that hit Europe. So it, it, it's kind of hard to, to look at what happened in the US and say we could have gotten that kind of unemployment rate path if we had followed the, the, the US's dual mandate. And if I just think in terms of Canada, what we did, what we could have done differently. Um, you know, I think uh, we, 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 uh, the Bank of Canada raised its policy rate uh, in April of 2010 off of its effective lower bound and uh, managed to get it up to uh, one and three quarters percent. So it didn't, it didn't do a lot. It added 150 basis points over about uh, 10 years uh, to its policy rate. And uh, the timing I think was affected not so much because it was concerned about inflation getting out of hand, but it was concerned about uh, financial stability, which is something you, you, you didn't talk about uh, in this dual uh, mandate framework. I mean, after the great financial crisis, uh, in Canada, we were very concerned about uh, household indebtedness and the potential risks that the Canadian economy might face uh, if uh, we had our own uh, uh, housing bubble bust. And uh, although the Bank of Canada didn't have the mandate for financial stability, it was a partner with uh, the other agencies of government. It was kind of hard to keep feeding the fire of household indebtedness uh, uh, when uh, you know uh, we didn't get the uh, we didn't get uh, household debt. Uh, 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 recovering or, or re being reduced the way they did in the United States. Uh, Canadians didn't go uh, bankrupt, they didn't default on their mortgages. So we had this thing hanging over our shoulders that uh, other things equal uh, led to, uh, I think, uh, uh, a slightly faster increase in the path of the policy rate that we would have gotten otherwise. So I, I, I question what we would have done differently in Canada if we had had a dual mandate, uh, given the circumstances where we were concerned with financial stability risks as well. Well, I thank you very much for that question. In fact, I couldn't, I couldn't have put a better question out there. Um, so the first question is um, about the U.S. versus Canada. Okay. So as we went to, through two thousand and nine, 
remember financial markets, the most liquid markets were melting down. But strangely enough, and this is in the paper that I was referring to, um, that our paper refers to, it's an earlier paper, about 2009 and 2010, um, the Fed funds rate was expected to take off from the zero bound by late 2009. So in other words, despite the fact that the Fed had a dual mandate, financial markets thought that they were not gonna provide the monetary easing that was necessary to move the economy. And that's where we got all this forward guidance and QE because they effectively re reacted to what was going on in the markets and so on. Okay, so that's, that's kind of like my first point. Um, and the Bank of Canada kind of followed, followed along, right? Many central banks followed along. So not having adequate monetary policy frameworks at the time that really could express the dual mandate the way that it was meant to be expressed was a big problem. In fact, there's a paper uh, um, by some Fed guys that shows that it would have shaved off at least a percentage point on the unemployment rate had markets believed that they were actually gonna follow a dual mandate, okay? Now, regarding financial stability, your points really concern me because there are a lot of people out there that are pushing the idea that it's dangerous to keep interest rates low for long because that can result in financial stability. And I think in a lot of cases uh, in those countries that, that push those ideas, it actually results in getting stuck in low inflation traps. So you need to move aggressively with not only low interest rates, but fiscal policy. Hopefully, hopefully David is listening but fiscal policy and everything else to push you out of this world of low interest rates. Like you can't, you don't just choose higher interest rates. Uh, the Bank of Canada actually uh, determines an overnight rate. That's what it controls. And it's very, very clear that you have to delineate between what central banks can do about things like financial stability with interest rates and what they can't do. And clearly they can't do very much with the interest rate. And if you think that they can do things with the interest rate, then we are in for lots of financial instability because if we take our eye off the ball about the things that actually cause that financial instability um, and focus on things that like interest rates, then we'll, we'll just end up in, in deep problems. And you see that you know, time and time again throughout the world. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, so things are warming up here, folks. We've got, uh, we've got uh, 18 minutes or something like that before we're gonna wrap this up. Um, I've got three uh, uh, participants on deck for questions. Greg Catch, you still get to tell me if you want to ask a question, then Steve Ambler, then Diane Belmer. But before those three start, Doug, I want you to have an opportunity to respond to Francisco uh, if you want to, uh, or you know, let me know if you don't want to, but, uh, or you can, you can take five minutes for that if you like. So the only, the only issue that I would have with Francisco, so there was two points about estimation, okay? And I'd just like to point out that the frontiers of inflation targeting uh, those central banks that are referred to, as well as all the other ones that have been very, very successful, did not use estimation techniques, okay? In fact, the methodology, the empirical methodology that we had used during the 1960s and the 1970s was the thing that actually got us into the problems of the 1970s and so on. And so that's the first point. Second point is, and is this issue of a welfare analysis. So I don't know if you looked at my CV, but I built one of the first DSG models and did welfare analysis. I soon left that game because the game did not involve the fundamental issue about unemployment. 
the SGE models do not include unemployment. They do not include the costs of unemployment. They do not include the costs of things like global financial crises. And so if you're gonna talk, if you're gonna, if you're gonna talk about those sorts of issues, you have, you have two choices. You can try to take them on and deal with a, a very, very difficult question, or you can deal with simplistic models that, you know, that simply try to tell a story that try to prevent you from going into a, a bad place where you have high unemployment and, and, and financial instability. So I wouldn't, uh, I guess that would be my reaction that, and it's not just a reaction to Francisco, it's a, it's a, re, it's a reaction to the academic community. I spent my entire career trying to uh, create a bond between the work that's going on in central banks and the work that's going on in academia. But I feel that we may have overshot a little bit in the sense that uh, while we in central banks have communicated what we're trying to do, academia has maybe uh, taken that, uh, a lot of those things a little bit too technical and have lost, you know, basic insights about what unemployment is and what financial instability is. So okay. Thank you. We've got four questions. I'm going to just bring your attention to the chat room. There's a comment from Mark Levesque you might want to take a look at on uh, unemployment data. And there's a comment from Pierre Fortin. Nice to see you, Pierre. There's a comment from Pierre Fortin on Canada-US unemployment differentials and to what extent it might be due to Humphrey Hawkins. So, but we're going to go to questions. I'm going to ask people for a reasonably short, pithy question and reasonably short, pithy answers, and then we're going to get them all in. Greg Katz, you're number one. Okay, I'll try to be quick here. So when I saw the chart on Canada's unemployment rate, I guess I got a little bit defensive here. So I had to look at the data and compare it to uh, New Zealand's unemployment rate. And sure enough, both countries spiked by exactly two and a half percentage points during the global financial crisis. And Canada had regained one and a half percentage points by 2012, but New Zealand was still stuck at its, at its uh, crisis peak. So if New Zealand was doing, you know, if it's being held as a gold standard, basically, for this kind of dual mandate, um, why did its unemployment rate stay so high relative to Canada's post-crisis? And why did Canada's unemployment rate come down, even though it's not one of, our, one of our targets? So a very simple answer to that is the dual mandate thing in New Zealand was a result of that. Okay? Mm -hmm. so that's the answer. Okay. The result of that, those experiences. Okay, Steve Ambler, you are next. Diane Belmer, you are on deck. And Mario Sacareccia is after Diane. So, uh, Steve. Okay, I'll try and be pithy. Um, nice presentation, Doug. So this is related to your, your presentation and Francisco's comments. You start off with uh, a loss function. So you have the inflation gap, and then it seems to me you, could, you have a choice of three real variables to put in there. It could be the output gap, it could be the deviation from the natural unemployment rate, or it could be uh, the employment gap. And that, you know, with the U.S. dual mandate, they say maximum sustainable employment. So that yeah. means that you, so, so the, the question is, and if you want to do rigorous inflation forecasting, targeting in the sense of Svensson, you would need model consistent estimates of the of, of potential or the natural unemployment rate which would imply a search model or uh, modeling the participation rate uh, and if you if you don't have a fully rigorous model consistent uh, versions of those things do you at least allow them to vary over time yeah so the answer is so obviously it was i was simplifying things but uh, the more you would get into this, the more you would look into um, what's behind the output gap, okay? Just as they did in the US, for example, the participation rate was, you know, fell during the, the crisis. And a lot of people believe that a lot of those people were discouraged workers and so on, right? So when I use the unemployment rate, it's 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 an indicator, but this entire research agenda would obviously require more research on what is full employment and you know, and so on. So, 
Okay, next Good question job. is from a participant in our Red Chamber. Diane Belmer, thank you for your service in the Red Chamber. Question mm -hmm. is yours. You are muted. You are muted, Diane. We can't hear you. <laughs> it's a question, but it's a mostly a, a comment uh, about those uh, effects uh, and the comparison with the United States and Canada. And uh, I wanted to talk about it tomorrow, but I think it's time to, to talk about it now. In my previous lives, I have a chair aboard uh, where we were managing active labor markets policy uh, in Quebec, managing federal and provincial funds. And uh, I uh, was doing that in the 90s. When I started to, uh, to chair this, uh, this big office, unemployment rate in Quebec was over 10%. Uh, in Canada, it was 2% below. And uh, we, were, we had a very, very tight monetary policy. And when you look at real rates of interest in that from the mid 90s to uh, uh, the beginning of 2000, the real interest rates were really high and they were fluctuating more, more so than the US rate. But my point is that sharing that managing the labor force programs at that time, it was awful with a 10% unemployment rate and the mandate to decrease the unemployment rate. What we did, we had no choice because the, the monetary policy was keeping the Canadian average at 8%. That was the so-called Nehru uh, commanding uh, to do. So we could not uh, really train the people. We could not find jobs for them. So what we did do, we were applying time reduction of work. And uh, more, we were doing anticipating retirement programs. And uh, we were not the only one to do that. And when you look at the statistics, the participation rate decreased, and it decreased in Canada for a while. So my conclusion, when being an economist, I was teaching economics before, before doing that, and it was the only thing to do to help people in, in this period. So the conclusion from a practical side to the academic side is that monetary policy is not neutral and it affects potential output because those people who retired or even those who, who did not get the job that they were trained to, they decrease the potential production. So. The dual mandate can help not do that by all sorts of ways. So that's the point I wanted to make to add a, an historical perspective and the effect of a monetary policy on potential output. Thank so you, Doug. I don't know. I would ask from Douglas if it's possible. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, you can probably tell what my age is, and I knew you know, about unemployment in Canada. We had unemployment insurance in 1970 where we really loosened everything. And we got a big increase in the natural rate of unemployment. And we also got at the same time for other reasons, but somewhat related to that, uh, inflation. And so naturally, uh, policymakers focused on things that would reduce unemployment and things that would reduce inflation. And the problem is that we've probably gone too far. Okay, we haven't, so this is, this is, the, this is the art of doing policy making, right? That you learn from your history, um, the people, and I'd like to point this out to Bill Robson, the people that don't learn from history have some issues because you, you have to realize that sometimes you can go too far. Uh, you, can ex you can achieve, in the case of the Bank of Canada, 2% inflation, and it can look really, really good. But the problem is you've gone too far. You've, you've, you've achieved that, and you believe that that's a really good thing because 
you had unstable inflation expectations in the past. In the case of high unemployment, you believe that you've reduced your unemployment insurance and your, and your protection to people that are unemployed, but you've gone too far, okay? So we have to know when is too far, okay? And so that's, I think unemployment through my entire career, unemployment is the, by far, despite the fact that I worked on monetary policy issues, unemployment is the big problem, okay? Unemployment is the really costly problem in society because if it's allowed to persist, and we've seen that in the case of the, the Fed, for example, them driving unemployment down to very, very low levels, we've seen it affecting people's livelihoods. Uh, we've, like, people have been turned from being completely unproductive to being attached to the labor force. And that this is a cut off there because we've got a final question coming in from Mario. Uh, Mario, you can turn up. There we go. Mario, take it away because you, you are. Yes, I, uh, I'll be very quick here. I'm, uh, yeah. I, I, first of all, I want to congratulate you, Doug, for, uh, you know, really a, uh, actually what you're even seeing right now. <laughs> Look, you just said that. I, I, I support you entirely. Indeed, and also your critique of the SEG you know, model, you know that, where they do not recognize unemployment, uh, you know, as, as a concern even, I would say, you know, they assume that away. I personally uh, have one comment to make uh, that I think uh, you, I, I, you have alluded to it, but perhaps you haven't emphasized it enough, which is that one is this important issue regarding coordination between fiscal and monetary policy. When you establish a dual mandate, it also establishes, the, in a sense, credibility on the fiscal side here that they should be concerned about unemployment as well and not necessarily go the route of balanced budgeting, which is what happened immediately after the, uh, you know, in 2010 in Canada, which is that the government time, you know, was so vigorous in trying to get back to, to balance budget that it created havoc at the end. Uh, and uh, more importantly, though, is the fact that what you want is that the central bank does not become an impediment, I would say here, okay, to achieving more quickly high employment because of its fears of inflation all the time. And if they have a dual mandate, I think that would more rigorously get it, you know, to, to reduce that unemployment rate, rather than the situation where we have right now, which is that the the official concern is getting that two percent goal. Yeah, so I agree with that. I agree with that entirely. Okay, um, like for example, how long did it take to anchor long-term inflation expectations in Canada? The answer is not until we balance the federal budget, okay? Um, so we had not brought long-term, so I was amused by the, by the discussions, graphs that started in the 90s, but we didn't actually achieve anchored long-term inflation expectations. We didn't eliminate that long-term interest rate differential of 100 basis points until we had a responsible government, okay? Now you can think, and this is in the paper, that is second paper that I referred to in my, when we talked about the coordinated and approach to monetary and fiscal and a macroeconomic approach to, to policy and so on. Um, but at the same time, you know, now that you've got that freedom, now you should be using it. Um, and there, in that paper, the other country is Japan. It's the other end of the spectrum that hasn't been using it effectively, right? And um, that's why we actually, in that paper, that's why we chose Canada and the US and Japan, because we thought we've got the two ends of the spectrums. We've got a country that's gone through the process of doing this correctly, figuring out what the solutions is relative to other countries versus a country that's in a real pickle that has to resort to very unconventional types of policies to get out of the, the situation that they we're in. So I, li I like your comments a lot, okay? Uh, uh, can I, um, I'd like to ask a question if I may, and I'm gonna ask Stephen Gordon to come in and uh, 
I'm going to have to jump off, but Steve Gordon can run the poll. And if this conversation keeps going, let it keep going, because I think it's great. But I'd like to ask a practical question. So suppose, suppose you wanted to do this. Um, my question is, if, if inflation is one of two variables in the dual mandate, what's the second? Uh, you know, an output gap has problems with measurement, obviously. Uh, if you looked at GDP growth rates or employment growth rates, there are problems of changes, changes in that trend uh, that we talked about in the previous session. If you looked at the unemployment rate, uh, that's got problems in the sense that you know that not every decline in the unemployment rate is a good thing. It might be people dropping out of the labor force. So from a very practical point of view, if you wanted to recommend some form of dual, uh, uh, dual target to a central bank or to the government, like, do you have an instinctive answer, Doug, for... We actually, have a, you... we, actually have, we actually have a chorus for central bankers, okay? Okay. And it's actually, we published it in multiple places. The last one was LSE that distinguishes between the output gap that's relevant for trading off output and inflation versus thinking about financial instability, okay? Now, the problem with academics, in fact, a lot of, in fact, 99% of the work that's done, they usually think about trend output. Okay, and trend output, what, what is trend output? Trend output depends on, it really depends on if, is it a high frequency trend, a low frequency trend or whatever. So if you start off your paper with that, okay, like most papers do, you're lost, okay? So you have to start off with the concept that's relevant for this trade-off, the short-run trade-off between monetary policy, output gaps, and inflation. Okay, that has to be that has to be very much in the mindset. And if you depart from that, you become lost. And 99% of the papers, empirical papers that do that, are lost. So this is not this is not a hard problem because this is just a problem because we've we get lost too much. And that's an example. That's an example where, so actually you can attend this class. We, we will train you about how to think about financial instability and trend output and so on, which is about the mean of the distribution. And we will teach you about how to think about the trade off between output and inflation. Okay. I want to thank you very much. All of you. I'm going to drop off. I'm turning it over to Stephen Gordon, he can manage the conversation if it keeps going. He can run the poll. Uh, when I come back tomorrow morning, you may still all be here, I hope, or tomorrow afternoon. I hope you will all be here. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all then. So thank you, Doug. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, all of those to ask questions. You stay here. I've got to disappear. See you tomorrow. Okay. See you, Chris. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, like, let's, I, like, I would like to do the poll now because there might be, be other people who have to leave. So, um, Katrine, or, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Poll is up. Please vote. Don't stop until they make you stop. Uh, can I vote on nominal GDP? I don't know. Uh, you, oh, you might not, uh, you might have, like, there are technical things if you're, yeah, I think right now you're like officially a co-host and you might not have voting powers. I'll make have, it much faster. So, so far, I'm winning massively, but I would just like to say that nominal GDP, that we could, we need to consider building a better case for it, but um, that's. Okay. I think we've maxed out at, yep, there we go. Okay, thank you. So. The poll is now in the books, and yes, looks like you want. Um, okay, <clears throat> if there's anybody else who would like to say something, I don't know if we want to continue on in this format where one person at a time, or maybe we can just open the mics and can just as if we, uh, like we did at the end of the first session, just 
leave it open and whoever wants to talk can talk. Let's just, let's just, how many, 